Rally racing is rarely for the faint-hearted. The lack of paved roads and control over turbocharged vehicles makes it one of the most intense forms of motor racing. Throw in open-ended regulations that encourage teams to bend the rules, and it becomes evident why only about half the competitors manage to even reach the finish line. Clearly, rally racing's no stranger to extreme highs and extreme lows. But even by these standards, one series in the 1980s managed to pull off something so spectacular it would immediately cannonball its way into the history books. Seriously, this series was the motoring equivalent of your favorite TV show releasing an entire season of just finale episodes. Between 1982 and 1986, the FIA sanctioned a championship rally series, the infamous Group B. Through this set of regulations, the governing body gave manufacturers scope to experiment with technology. It also placed little limitation on weight and displacement, creating a recipe for pure racing mayhem. The cost of developing the cars remained incredibly high, ensuring that only the most renowned manufacturers with the top drivers and engineers could afford to enter. The result? Some of the most powerful and sophisticated race cars the world had ever seen, and what enthusiasts would go on to call the golden era of racing. Group B wouldn't be where it was without its drivers, with names like Walter Rohrl, Hanu Mikala, and Michelle Mouton inserting themselves in the annals of racing history. But among the many individuals who helped make this series legendary was a German automotive chassis engineer who remained firmly behind the scenes, Georg Bensinger. This is the story of how Bensinger's spark of an idea snowballed into the most revolutionary rally car the world's ever seen, the Audi Quattro. In 1968, Bensinger joined the R&D department of Audi, a subsidiary of the German giant VW Group. A few years later, he was testing a Volkswagen Iltis, a four-wheel drive military off-road vehicle, along with fellow engineer Roland Gumpert on an ice and snow-covered road in Scandinavia. Impressed by how the Iltis had powered its way through the challenging terrain, Bensinger had thought, would it be possible to replicate the concept of a four-wheel drive in a conventional on-road car? Through the smell of grease, fuel, and burning rubber, Bensinger got a faint whiff of something else, the smell of victory. He was certain that this idea could propel Audi to rally racing greatness. He wasted no time relaying this thought to Audi's head of R&D at the time, Ferdinand Peach. Peach was and remains a legend in automobile circles. He was the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, the founder of Porsche himself. He was also the visionary and engineer behind the Porsche 917 the most decorated racing car that Porsche ever built. For context, in the 1970s, this car gave Porsche its first ever Le Mans win and swept nine out of 10 races at the World Sports Car Championship. Later in his career, Peach would become the chief executive of the Volkswagen Group, helping steer the VW ship back towards greatness. But that's a story for another day. He's also credited with turning it into one of the world's biggest automobile manufacturers, but arguably, one of Peach's most iconic decisions came back in the 1970s, when it was first approached by Bensinger. It took very little time for Peach to realize what his engineer was sitting on, being a motorsport visionary himself after all. He immediately gave Bensinger the go-ahead to test the Audi 80, an ordinary car with a four-wheel system and without a center differential. He also recommended developing a rally prototype to properly showcase the technology. And so, in 1977, in a remote corner of Germany, Audi began testing its new technology. To raise the stakes, this test wasn't carried out on a regular road. Instead, the location was an abandoned quarry, full of rock, aggregate, and gravel. Through the displaced rubble and rising smoke, the team immediately confirmed their initial theory. The four-wheel system gave the car incredible amounts of grip. This increased traction and stability allowed it to take sharp corners on loose surfaces much faster and more reliably than any other model in VW's arsenal. The smell of success intensified as the engineers realized they were on the brink of building the perfect rally car. In 1978, in a boardroom in Germany, the Audi Sport Department was set up to pave this road to success. It began work on the Audi Quattro, a four-wheel drive car that would outperform any other vehicle in snow and offer exceptional grip on gravel. But before it could competitively launch the car, there was a minor hurdle to overcome. And by minor, of course, we mean absolutely devastating. The FIA which governs motorsport, isn't known for its brevity. Its list of regulations could make a set of encyclopedias look like a light read. Hidden in one page of the regulations was a little rule with big consequences for Audi. Four-wheel drive cars were not permitted in rallying. The good part was that in racing, lobbying is not only permitted but encouraged. 
A year later, Audi sent a representative to an FIA meeting to get the law struck down. This seemingly innocent representative played their cards perfectly. As the governing body was wrapping up its meeting, the representative tactically asked in passing if it was necessary to have a rule on four-wheel drives. Since the drivetrain was, up to that point, associated with much bigger vehicles, the FIA took no issue with this. Other manufacturers also didn't object, assuming that anyone who wanted to put four-wheel technology in a rally car had probably breathed in too much exhaust fumes. So the FIA struck the rule down the following year, paving the way for Audi to carry on with its plans for rally domination. In March 1980, the Audi Quattro was revealed at the Geneva Motor Show. The car's first appearance was at the 1980 Janner Rally in Austria. There was nothing special about its appearance. Its body was similar to its on-road model. But hidden away was an engine that packed approximately 300 bhp. That year, the car failed to make a serious impact. But interestingly, the bulky Volkswagen Iltis that served as its inspiration won the grueling over 20-day-long Paris-Dakar Rally a sign of what was to come. In 1981, the success of the Audi Quattro had begun to accelerate. To coincide with its looming success, Audi Sport announced a new head of sport and special developments, Roland Gumpert. That's right, the same Gumpert who had tested the Iltis with Bensinger back in 1977. Armed with a wrench, a thick beard, and immense knowledge of a technology he had helped pioneer, Gumpert changed the fortunes of Audi Sport. The team that hadn't seen much success in the WRCs of the past suddenly emerged as a force to be reckoned with. At the 1981 WRC, the Quattro started strong. Finnish driver Hannu Mikola surprised the rest of the pack by winning his second race in the car. The race was held in Sweden, a track notoriously covered in snow. Bensinger's vision, it seemed, had finally begun to take shape. It didn't end there. Mikola also won the RAC rally in Great Britain, proving the car was quick on gravel and tarmac. He then landed on the podium in his home race, the 1000 Lakes Rally in Finland. What really grabbed headlines that year, however, was a win courtesy of the most successful female driver in motorsport history. French driver Michelle Mouton won the Rally San Remo in 1981, becoming the first and only woman ever to win a round of the WRC. Her win really cemented Audi's reputation as a serious rally competitor. By the end of 1981, Audi could only manage fifth in the manufacturer's title. But individual successes and the promise the car had shown would set them up nicely for the 1982 championship, the first year of the infamous Group B regulations. In 1982, the Audi Quattro A1 car was launched. The power output of the turbocharged inline five-cylinder engine was raised to approximately 350 horsepower. In layman's terms, I guess you could say this car wasn't kidding around. Three of Audi's drivers, Michel Mouton, Hannu Mikola, and Stig Blomqvist, did an exceptional job of piloting it. They won seven races that season and achieved several other podium finishes. It's fair to say that they got really good at spraying champagne. By the end of the year, the drivers would only just lose out on the drivers' championship title to a dominant Walter Rorel, who pulled off some incredible races of his own. But Mouton, Mikola, and Bloomquist did finish second, third, and fourth in the standings, earning Audi its first ever WRC manufacturer's title. Barely a few years after its technology was tested at an abandoned quarry, the Quattro was already threatening to topple the legacy of the world's best-designed supercars. The following year, the Audi Quattro A2 was introduced, even as the A1 was showing the world that using all four wheels was better than just two. Between these two cars, Audi's drivers won five races, with Hannu Mikola managing to clinch the drivers' championship. The team, however, finished second in the manufacturer's title behind Lancia. There's a story here as well. At that point, Lancia was, interestingly, one of the only teams that hadn't developed a four-wheel drive yet. While this would change in the following years, in 1983, it did end up giving them a slight edge, as they didn't suffer as many mechanical problems as their four-wheel drive competitors. A few clever tricks also helped. Before the Monte Carlo race, for instance, members of the Lancia team walked along the track, pouring salt to melt the snow and ice, and ensuring that the four-wheel Audi Quattro wouldn't have a significant advantage. Ingenious also a sign of what it would take for a two-wheel drive car to ever win the WRC again. By 1984, Audi had effectively made the two-wheel drive a relic of the past. Walter Rorel had left Lancia and switched over to Audi, joining a lineup that already featured Mikola, Mouton, and Stig Blomqvist. The manufacturer also introduced a smaller version of the Quattro, the S1. 
This model had an all-aluminum alloy body and was producing around 450 bhp. With this intimidating driver lineup and rocket ship of a car, there was no turning back. The Quattro dominated almost every race that year. Rain, snow, gravel, you name it, the Quattro was leading the way. It swept six of the first eight events and comfortably secured a second manufacturer's championship. Stig Blomqvist claimed the driver's title in style, using all four wheels of the Quattro to run the competition over. In 1985, however, a new competitor arrived on the scene. The Peugeot, which had silently been building up a comeback over the previous season, clinched the manufacturer's title. Audi could only manage second, with a single race win courtesy of Walter Rohrl. The reason for Peugeot's success? The 205T16, another four-wheel drive car. By this point, the impact of Bensinger's idea had clearly made its mark on rally racing, even if it wasn't just Audi that benefited. By 1986, Audi made a final upgrade and introduced the Audi Sport Quattro S1 E2. This monster of a car featured an inline five-cylinder engine that displaced 2,110 cc and officially produced 476 horsepower. Although many estimates suggest that the actual figure was well over 500 bhp, the car had more downforce, weighed much less at 1,090 kilograms, and could go from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 3.1 seconds. This car was truly the pinnacle of everything the Group B regulations stood for. Unfortunately, in 1986, the S1 E2 didn't get a chance to shine. By this point, every car in the group was reaching absolutely insane speeds. However, coupled with a general lack of safety for drivers and spectators, this was a disaster waiting to happen. In the Portugal rally, the first of two tragedies struck. During the race, a Ford piloted by Joachim Santos went off track. In those days, there were very limited crowd control. Spectators often jumped on track, hoping to get a better view of their favorite vehicles in action. On that fateful day, everyone's biggest fear came true. The Ford slammed into a crowd of spectators, injuring 31 and killing three others. The race was suspended, but further events went ahead as planned. That is, until a few races later, when once again, the dark side of motorsport reared its ugly head. At the Corsica Rally in France, a Lancia piloted by the championship leader, Henri Toivonen, went careening off the road and plummeted down a hill. Two men, Toivonen and his co-driver Sergio Cresto, died on the spot. A few hours later, the FIA announced that Group B cars would no longer be permitted. Audi withdrew from the event. After amassing 23 championship rally wins, two manufacturer titles, two driver titles, and a huge fan base, the team decided to call it quits. As a parting gift, the 750-horsepower Quattro S1 broke one final record. In 1987, Walter Rohrl covered the 14.42 miles of the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb in under 11 minutes, shattering the previous record by a solid 22 seconds. But even though 1986 marked the end of Audi's run at the WRC, it wouldn't be the last we would see of the Quattro. In later years, the car dominated paved circuits at the Trans Am Series, the German Touring Car Championship, and the IMSA GT Championship. Between 1980 and 1991, Audi produced over 11,000 examples of the Quattro, even though they had initially only planned to make 400. But while 1991 would spell the end of the original Quattro, the technology still lives on today. In motorsport, the Quattro system helped Audi dominate at the Le Mans, winning 13 times since the early 2000s. In production cars, it became the branded term used to refer to all Audi vehicles that have a four-wheel drive system. By 2020, Audi had sold over 11 million vehicles with a Quattro badge. Over 80% of the models it launched that year had at least one Quattro variant. In the last few years, Audi had also launched a Quattro version of its e-tron electric SUVs, ensuring the system continues making its mark, even in the electric car revolution. It's safe to say that it was that glorious run at the WRC and one simple idea that took Audi from being an inferior VW and granted it the status it holds today.